Um, no, it's just not not like made specifically Is for it kids. Because of your comments? <laughs> well, there's that. Okay. Anyway, no. Um, but I, I was mindful of the fact that like the whole world shut down uh, over like a virus, and then um, one of the greatest scientific miracles of like your lifetime took place, where like in history, historically, to develop a vaccine and get it out safely has taken years and years and years and years and years and years. And to make sure uh, that we were able to do that in a way that wasn't harmful. Um, and it, it's so easy because humans are fundamentally bad at identifying how risk works, right? So like most people who got COVID were fine. And so it's easy from that to be like, what was the big deal? Why did everything shut down? Right? Like I got, I, did ever, I, I haven't had it yet actually. I never got COVID, That's but I imagine most home. people have. But uh, I, I have. Everyone else in my family has. Yeah. And um, I know one person who died from COVID, um, my great-grandmother. She was quite old. Um, she was 107, so, like, you know, she had a pretty good run. Uh, not to be frank, but realistically, something was going to take her out, right? You don't live too much past 107. Um, well, guys, I hate to tell you this. It's the truth. We're all going to die. Um, but, uh, but, like, so you can look at that and say, and then I knew a few people sort of, like, you know, friends of friends or family members of friends who passed away from COVID, but most people, you know, got COVID, got sick, and they got better. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, like, in two years, COVID killed more people uh, in America than all the wars they've ever been involved in put together. So, like, that's a pretty big number. Um, and they killed a lot of people. And, and um, well, it's kind of a cold answer. I don't know that I love that as an answer. Um, I mean, it, it, for the record, it is indeed natural selection, which is to say, uh, you know, yeah, some people are, for whatever reason, predisposed to be affected more by COVID and some predisposed to be affected less by it. And yes, when a disease spreads, the people who are less predisposed to be killed by it survive and the people more predisposed to be killed by it die. Um, what we try to do in medical science is stop that natural selection and just say, what if nobody had to die? Or what if very few people? Because nothing can prevent, nothing is 100% effective, right? If there's no vaccine in the world, that's 100% effective. Um, but yeah, so this medical miracle happened. And like the science involved in rolling a vaccine out in I think what would end up being about 18 months before it was like out in the general public. Um, it's crazy. The even crazier thing is, do you know when the vaccine was actually made? Like, like three, no, like three months after uh, three months after it was first identified, they'd already built the vaccine. And everything after that was just testing it to make sure it was safe, to figure out dosages, to figure out all those things. Um, but the fact of the matter is in the modern era where we can get a virus and look at how it's made at an atomic level, we can very quickly, and in the future, what we learn from that, we will probably be able to roll out vaccines on a much faster time scale, even faster and faster. But what always blew my mind was people were watching TV every day and they were like, digging into like every day there'd be a press conference and like Trudeau would give one and Ford would give one and then the states um, Cuomo would give one and they'd be going into excruciating detail about these numbers and that numbers and wastewater figures and all this and do you know what I never once saw? I never once saw them say like hey this is what a virus is this is how it works and this is what a vaccine is this is how it works if you think back I bet you didn't see it either because I'm convinced that it just never got said and it's weird you think like why not have like a little animation? You could have a little like, I don't know, like a little like 3D animated guy and he could have like googly eyes and be like, oh, I'm a SARS virus. And then you could have like a little cell and be like, oh, I'm one of the cells of your respiratory tract. And then you could show them like fighting. I don't know. See what I mean? Like a little animation, like a cute thing. And then you could have a narrator and he'd be like, when the virus in fact, like just, I don't know, teach people what this stuff is. I never saw it. I never saw it on the news, never saw it in a press conference. And what, what blows my mind is our world was shut down for three years. And if you ask people to talk about like really sophisticated medical stuff, like what was the wastewater percentage of this or that, and what's the R value of this disease spreading, in the midst of COVID, adults could talk about that. But if you went, on, if you went out and asked people, hey, could you tell me what a virus is? I would be prepared to guess that the overwhelming majority of adults wouldn't be able to answer that question for you despite what we all just went through. And I don't think that's a sign of people doing something wrong. I don't think that means people are stupid. I don't think it means anything like that. I think it means that like the science education system, which for the record is me, is doing something terribly, 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 terribly wrong. Right, does that make sense? 
Um, this is important information. So today we're going to talk about viruses and we're going to talk about something else as well called prions. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but this, uh, well, actually both are accepted pronunciations, so you're good. Um, but, okay, we all lived through COVID. How many of us love that experience? Fascinating. How many of, I will talk later, I'm very curious. How many of you hated it with a passion of a thousand burning suns? Ooh, this guy. And the rest of you, I guess, fall somewhere in the middle. Um, okay, so we've all been through it. We all lived through it. Go. What's the virus? Talk to me. I'm serious. What's a virus? Just tell me. So, surely somebody knows what a virus is. Yeah, go. Okay, good. So it's something that infects us and affects, did you say infects or affects? Affects. Okay, it affects our immune system. That is true. Which is to say you have a system in your body called the immune system. What's your immune system's job? To fight off bacteria, viruses. To fight off bacteria, viruses, to fight off stuff, right? And whatever a virus is, it affects our immune system. So a, a virus gets our immune system going. True, good. Keep going. What's a virus? Yeah. Good, very good. Whatever it is, it's contagious. So if I have a virus and I'm not careful, I can give you a virus. And viruses can be passed in different ways. How was SARS passed on? Uh, SARS, like, uh, like COVID, right? Uh, the virus itself is called SARS-CoV-2, and we call the condition it gives you COVID-19, right? But the actual virus itself is called the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's a, a SARS virus, which we encountered them before. How did it get passed along? Uh, like air. In air, great. So, right? Like air contamination. Air contamination. Contaminated by what? I mean, the virus, obviously, but how? Yeah. Oh, go. Okay, an organism? Yeah. Cool. Okay, cool. I like that. So it's some kind of organism. We'll talk about that. And it multiplies when it gets into the body of a host. So lots of great words there. Um, and some of which are spot on, and some of which I'm going to push off, push back on a bit. But that's good. We're right in the right direction there. Yeah. Feeds on the body of a host. Interesting. Very interesting with feeds. We'll talk about that too. Again, very much in the right direction. And a couple of a nuance to push back on there. Yeah. Okay, now that, very good. Um, this is talking about um, not the virus itself, but sort of how they spread, so the experience of them, how, how they move through a population, but that's true. We can talk about things being endemic, epidemic, pandemic. Um, endemic means that it's sort of inside a certain community, inside a certain spot. An epidemic means that it's broken out. And a pandemic, um, which people have been telling us was coming for years again, um, and that we should be ready for it, but spoiler alert, we weren't, um, is when that epidemic spreads pan, like the whole world, right, from here to there. Um, and of course, why do we, why do endemic viruses, you know, conditions become epidemic? Well, you told me that they spread, and that they multiply when they're inside the host, right? Um, and that, you know, it just ends up in the air, and of course, if I have it, then I can give it to you. But the problem is, what if one of us, uh, you know, wants to go visit our uncle in Florida? But then everybody in Florida starts getting it. Well, then it can get to Florida. And if it gets one person in Florida, because you told me it spreads and it multiplies, then it can get to two and so on. And of course, we live in a global era, right? We live where, yeah, this originated in what? The Wuhan region of China. Uh, all our best evidence tells us, right? And so, um, yeah, no, I don't know to what extent that's confirmed. I don't think it is. But we know, we know that's where it came from. And of course, the problem is that in an era where, you know, millions of flights are, are up in the air in a month, you know, like there's people moving all over the place, um, things spread quickly, right? I want to get talking about then, and one thing, um, and again, very good overall, but somebody mentioned organism, and that's interesting, because when we talk about an organism, we talk about something that's alive, right? And remind me quickly, what were kind of our key things we said about life? Yeah, well, you said they reproduce, right? Yeah, um, lifespan. Okay, what else? Hmm? Um, we said they respire, right? Um, so they, you know, they use nutrients in their environment, right? They use nutrients, they produce waste. What else? Yeah, I'm not going to put that, though, I, I agree, but I want to really kind of hone in on the key things here, but for sure. Adaptation, cool. 
They adapt, respond to their environment. Right. They're made of cells. They use they need and use energy. Good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm gonna I'm gonna call that under reproduction, but absolutely. Okay. So now um just quickly remind ourselves of the six kingdoms, which are animals, so animalia, plantae, fungi. I'll give you the hard one, protista, or the other two? Bacteria and archaea. Okay. Where do viruses go? No. No, like which of these? They're not bacteria. No. No. They don't. That's right. They don't. They don't belong to any of these. Because, well, yeah, of course. Um, viruses don't belong to any of these. Um, and the reason they don't belong to any of these is because by our classical definition of being alive, they aren't. Viruses are not made of cells. Um, they don't need to use energy in the, the way that our cells typically do. Um, you could make the argument they adapt or respond to their environment, so we'll leave that. They don't respire as cells typically do. Lifespan, not really, and reproduce with a caveat, not on their own. So viruses are really interesting um, because, oh, sorry, I had this down here. They don't. Um, we don't find viruses in any of the kingdoms because they don't satisfy the requirements of what we typically say to be a living thing. Now, there are some people who classify viruses as a living thing and just call them their own kingdom, and that's fine. But if we do that, we have to understand that they are very, very, very different from all of our other living things. They, they, they function fundamentally very differently. Um, so the first thing to understand is that they are incredibly small by cell standards. All right? So they are much smaller than, than cells. Even the smallest of cells. They're also incredibly simple. They're basically composed of two parts. Um, they have a protein capsule, or shell if you want to think of it as that. Um, and inside that protein capsule is found genetic material. And what's genetic material typically? DNA, DNA or? RNA. That's right. And some viruses contain DNA, and some contain RNA. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but this is the basic outline. Um, they don't have a membrane. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have any organelles. But like even prokaryotes, they don't have organelles, but they're full of cytoplasm, and that cytoplasm is full of machinery. They're full of all kinds of proteins that do stuff. Enzymes and cellular mechanisms and microtubules, all kinds of stuff that does stuff. Viruses don't. They have this little simple protein capsule and inside of that, they have some genetic material. And um, they just kind of float around. Right? They're not motile on their own. Um, now, their DNA, just like yours, is indeed a blueprint of the protein capsule. That makes sense? Um, so DNA is always a blueprint to make proteins. So in this case, the DNA inside of a virus um, is the blueprint to make that virus. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, of the protein capsule and some other information, but they're very short. Um, you can actually look up the sequence, the genetic sequence of different viruses, including the SARS-CoV-2 virus that, that caused all of this kind of chaos in our world. Right? So if you look up 
the uh, gene sequence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, of course, there's a bunch of them. We keep getting variations, right? Because they are there. Um, but this is the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. True, isolate Wuhan who won. This was the first um, of the uh, sequences. And if you look here, this particular virus, SARS-CoV-2, um, is single-stranded. That's what SS means. Um, so it's a single strand of what type of genetic material? RNA. RNA. Is that why it's RNA? That's right. Um, and if you look here, if you scroll down, there's the gene sequence of it. And that may seem long. By gene standards, that is incredibly short. This is a pretty small piece of DNA. Um, specifically, well, RNA, I guess I should say. Specifically, it is 29,903 base pairs. Um, just to give you kind of a sense of something similar, this would be the gene sequence of a uh, human... Uh, let's go with uh, let's go with like uh, actually let's go um, hemoglobin. That's a nice. I think that's a single protein. So yeah. Oh no, this is just one subunit of hemoglobin. That's right. So this is just one lobe of four lobes of a piece of hemoglobin, and you'll see that its sequence is how long? Um. Yeah, where is it? You know, it's probably on the order of thousand. Um, why can't I find this? It said it like when it, you had like all the links for the website, like if you go back. Three thousand. No, that's its ID, but that's okay. This is also the National Institute of Health, so that should be... Uh, why can't I find its transcript? Oh, there we are. Anyway, long story short, what you'll find is that when we look this up, um, this tells you which... This is found on chromosome 11. It shows you where in the chromosome. They've totally changed this, uh, this website, how you find the stuff. Well, anyway, we'll come back to it. Long story short, um, this virus's RNA is about the size of what could be a single gene in, in a human. Does that make sense? It is not a big piece of code. Um, and then it's got this protein capsule. Like if you look at the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, micrograph, if we actually look at this thing under a microscope um, and see what we see, it looks like that. And you've probably seen diagrams that look like this. It's basically circular. That in there is its RNA. And then it's got all these little kind of spokes on the outside. And that's a real image, not made with light, but made with an electron microscope of what this looks like. And there it is sort of uh, in situ. So now, what's that mean? Well, they're very simple. Um, they are composed of this protein capsule and this genetic material. They are non-motile, all right? They're not like moving around. Uh, they're moved by their environment. But because they're so small, if they end up in a little bit of fluid and you happen to sneeze that out or cough that out, um, they will just float around on the air. Um, Is there like disinfectant time of like 72 hours or something? Like you could... Yeah, without, like, obviously, if you use a disinfectant, um, it will break it up. And all you need is something that will break up that protein capsule, and you're fine. So alcohol works, right? If you just use hand sanitizer, which is just alcohol, um, that will break this apart, right? Even if you didn't, like, it, it would just stay there, and so... Yeah, and they degrade, different viruses degrade at their own rates. So there's some viruses that will stay intact for long periods of time, um, left to their own devices. I believe, yeah, 72 hours is what they typically said was like kind of the half-life of a, of a COVID virus, right? So they degrade fairly quickly, which is advantageous. We're lucky with that, right? If they degraded under, over a longer time frame, they would be even more dangerous. Um, but they're able to attach to specific cells. 
And this is what's interesting, is that that has to do with that protein capsule. If you look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, its protein capsule has these little, ready for scientific terms, sticky outy bits, right? bits that jet out of it. And those are perfectly formed to latch on to certain types of cells, specifically cells of the human respiratory tract. Does that make sense? Um, so, yeah. Able to attach, to attach to specific cells, I'm sure is exactly what I meant when I wrote that. Um, so I Sam, what was that? Was there something wrong? Sam, could you stop wasting my time? Could we do that? Could we just stop? Like, the sentence is perfectly clear, and yet here you are, interrupting class to criticize me. I don't really appreciate it. So it's just fun fact. Here's the note. Back in here. So, um, so that is about viruses. So how do these things live? What do they do? Well, um, I, I gave you a diagram here. I, I alternate. Some years I make you draw it. Um, here we're not. But we're going to kind of talk our way through this. So we're going to look at one specific example. All right? This is one specific type of virus. Um, so be aware that this would look different with SARS um, in as much as what does this type of virus infect? This is called a bacteriophage. That doesn't mean that the virus is a bacterium. It's not. It's a virus. It means that what does it infect? It infects bacteria. Yeah. This type infects bacteria. and we name it after the type of cell it infects. So this is called a bacteriophage. Uh, for example, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is so-called because it's a severe acute respiratory syndrome causing vi virus. Um, corona has to do with its shape. The little sticky outy bits make it look kind of like it has a halo around it. Um, so we call it the coronavirus, corona meaning halo. And respiratory, because what does it infect? The respiratory, the respiratory tract. This is called a bacteriophage because it infects bacteria. Um, so this is how it happens. This exists out in the world. How it got there, we don't know. We do, we do not know where viruses came from. We know they've been around a long time. You wanna know something kind of creepy? A huge percentage of your DNA, well, we'll get to it, comes from bacteria, or comes from viruses, rather, that have infected your ancestors and managed to not kill you, um, which is good. We're glad it hasn't killed you. But they've been around a long time. We have evidence of things getting viral infections going back a long, long, long time in evolutionary history. Um, but how they came to be, we don't know. But here's what we do know. This thing cannot reproduce on its own. So you could leave this by itself for a million years, and if it doesn't die, or if it doesn't degrade, I should say, because it's not living, and you can't die if you're not living, if it doesn't degrade, it cannot reproduce. It has none of the mechanisms needed. It can't undergo photosynthesis. It has no cellular machinery, no enzymes, just this capsule and the DNA inside, or RNA, as the case may be. So what happens? Well, what happens is that on this particular virus, these legs here um, are designed to latch on to some, uh, some of the glycolipids, some of the things that are present in the membrane of a bacterium. So this is able to latch onto a bacterium. When it does, <coughs> it injects its own DNA into the virus. Could be RNA. So this is the virus's genetic material, DNA or RNA, depending on the type of virus, depending on the type of bacterium. So it is designed that once it has latched onto a cell, it breaks open a space in the membrane and it injects its own RNA. And this is where it gets really clever. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna push that off just because we're gonna spend like a whole unit talking about that. So I'm just gonna say wait, is that okay? For now, just know that they're both, they're both a molecule that carries genetic information and the differences are actually pretty minor. RNA evolved first, it's a little bit simpler and DNA is sort of a more evolutionary complex version of the same thing but fundamentally what they are is a chain molecule that carries 
information in a coded message that tells the cell how to build stuff. Is that a sufficient answer for now? Great, we'll get back to you later. Um, so it injects this genetic material into the cell. Now remember, this genetic material is a blueprint to build a virus. But this, the virus can't use it to make a virus. Right? The virus doesn't have any machinery to read DNA, to make stuff from DNA. But hey, you know what has machinery to read DNA and build stuff? The cell. And in our case, in our nucleus, uh, bacteria don't have a nucleus, they're prokaryotic. But same idea, um, for a bacterium, it's just in the general cell, and they have proteins floating around whose whole job is to read DNA and build stuff from it. So what does the virus do? It says, hey, here's some DNA. And what then happens is that the cell reads that DNA. So the bacterium um, reads that DNA. and begins building the proteins it codes for. Now, think about this as really a very sophisticated sneak attack, right? This would be like, imagine if you wanted to like start a business. You're like, you know what? I'm going to make a car company. I'm going to make cars. And you're like, but Orlando, wouldn't you need to like buy a factory and like build stuff and things like that? And what if instead what I did was like hacked into like GM's uh, plant and just, you know, overrid all of their programming and just had them build my cars and I drove them off and sold them. It's basically what the virus does here. It latches onto the cell, it injects its DNA or its RNA, and then the cell begins reading that DNA or RNA and just making it and building it. Does that make sense? And before you know it, what you have is... Um, the cell will make a huge number of viral parts. So the, the DNA that the virus injects codes for making all the different parts of the capsule, and it also codes to tell the machinery of the cell to make copies of the viral DNA itself. Does that make sense? So it literally commandeers the cell and basically says, make a bunch of viruses. Finally, the DNA also uh, has the cell assemble them. So the cell will assemble the new viruses. And eventually, the viruses will be so many of them that they cause cell lysis. Um, which is a fancy way of saying they cause the cell to burst open. And the result is that what happens to the host cell? It's dead, it's gone. But what happens to all these viruses that the new cell built? Well, now they're not in the cell, now they are just free. And what can they all do? They can go find each one of them can go find a cell, attach to it, and repeat the process. Does that make sense? Um, when you like get a viral infection and you have a sore throat, the reason you have a sore throat is because the virus has found cells in your throat, it's gone inside them, turned them into little virus factories, and it has killed those cells. It's burst them open. So the reason your throat is sore is because the tissues of your cell, uh, the tissues of your throat, rather, the individual cells, are being destroyed. And if we had no mechanism to stop this, um, it would kill you every time. But of course, as viruses have been around, anything that is still around today obviously had to evolve some kind of mechanism to fight off viruses. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And this is an eternal arms race. This is something that's going back and forth, and you've experienced it now, is that as we develop new ways to kill viruses, <coughs> viruses mutate by random chance and they develop into better ways to kill us. This happened with SARS, perfect case in point. If everyone had just got the stupid vaccine when it was first available, they'd just all taken the thing, and everyone had got it, and everyone had social distanced for a little bit, and wait until the vaccine was in good shape and there, th the math tells us that we likely would have actually eradicated SARS. Uh, because the first vaccine was effective enough at fighting that, that um, eventually um, you reach a point where 
human sort of fighting off of the virus outpaces the virus's ability. Now, we did a really poor job communicating that that virus was safe and that it was effective and how it works. And I think that was a mistake. And you can't force people to do something. And the fact of the matter is people don't make live logical decisions and people get nervous and people get scared and that's fair. But the fact of the matter is we had the opportunity to beat the thing and have it just be gone. And we've done this with diseases in the past. Um, we have fully eradicated several diseases by making effective uh, vaccines and giving them to people. And that's why when a baby is born, uh, they're given a schedule of vaccines. And the math tells us that even if a certain percentage of people don't get it, um, that won't matter because you won't get, you get something called herd immunity, where basically the people who don't get their vaccines are covered by the people who do. Um, but if you don't reach that percentage, the virus is allowed to kind of keep reproducing. And the problem is, as the virus is allowed to keep reproducing, what does it do? Well, every time it gets ma made, there's a chance that a change happens, right? And when those changes happen, some of them don't even work and the virus won't work and it just, that particular copy of the virus just dies out. But every once in a while you get a random change that makes this a bigger, better, stronger virus. That's better at attaching to cells and doing all its virusy stuff. And that's exactly what happened with COVID. And again, and again, and again, right? And these were the variants, the Omega variant and the Delta variant and all that. God only knows what variant we're up to now. Um, probably naming them after people now, like hurricanes, kind of like the Jeremy variant. But anyway, no one, no one has like a brother Jeremy in here and I just said something horribly offensive. If you do, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, and again, that's not, you know, like it's not about, you know, this, this isn't a political message for me, but it is a biological one, which is that left to itself, uh, this kills people. And so something like the bubonic plague, where we didn't have the ability to fight this, um, as it started to get worse and worse, before you know it, uh, estimates vary, but the most conservative estimates say somewhere between half and two thirds of people in Europe were killed by it over the span of about 80 years, um, which is, that's a lot of people, right? Um, modern technology lets us help our bodies fight off viruses, but in the end, we don't know how to kill a virus. I mean, we know how to kill a virus, but we don't know how to kill a virus without killing a person. The only thing we know how to do is tell your body, hey, this is what you should be on the lookout for. That's all the COVID vaccine was. The COVID vaccine was actually a little bit of mRNA that, uh, that went into your body and it simulated the shape of this thing so that your body would see the capsule of this. It basically made a copy of this virus in your body, but without any of the DNA inside of it. And so it taught your immune system, hey, this is what you should be on the lookout for. The reason you get sick when you get the vaccine is because that's a good thing. You, if you are feeling symptoms after a vaccine, that means that your immune system is fired up, which is good because it means your immune system has definitely seen what that virus looks like. But it also means you can't actually get sick and die because you don't actually have a virus inside of you. You just have something that looks like a virus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you feel sick and it feels crummy, but you're not actually in any real danger most of the time. By the way, uh, to the people who are like, well, there's nothing dangerous about a vaccine. Here's the deal. There is nothing you can inject into your body that won't in a certain percentage of times and a certain percentage of cases adversely react with somebody. And people are like, believe the science and nothing bad can possibly happen. That's not true. And saying that, um, you know, invalidates people's real experiences. There are absolutely people who got the vaccine and had an adverse reaction to it. There are absolutely people probably um, who took the vaccine and died. And that's horrifying. But when we talk about public health, you have to zoom out and say, there aren't five people on earth, there's eight billion. And what are the things that when you multiply it by eight billion people leave us safer? And the answer is something that kills one in 500 million people doesn't make that person dying any less tragic. And to say that never happens is really inappropriate and really unfair, but that is a better risk than something that kills one in every 100,000 people, right? Or in, which is roughly where Canadian COVID rates were all the way up to like the US where it kills something like what, roughly one in 20,000 people? Which now you're talking like a sizable chunk of the population, right? Um, and that's with treatment and with social distancing. Left to itself, it would kill a lot more than that. But it's like seatbelts. There's some kinds of car accidents where the seatbelt is the thing that kills you. That's horrible, that's tragic. But the alternative is all the accidents you have without a seatbelt where the lack of a seatbelt kills you and that's much more dangerous. Does that make sense? But I do think it's important to be honest about these things. Because I think sometimes we talk very smugly or very condescendingly to people who are worried about things, and I don't think that helps anybody. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta be open and keep your ego in check. 
and, and somebody with a big ego, it's important to remember that. Um, yeah. But this is the basic life cycle of a virus. It infects, it injects the DNA, and it turns the cell against itself. It turns that cell into a factory to build more viruses, which then get spread around. Um, this is one of two ways this happens. This is called the lytic cycle. The lytic cycle. Yeah, that's right. It comes from lysis. The second also involves the lytic cycle, but this is a little bit more um, insidious. This is called the ly lysogenic cycle. And in the lysogenic cycle, um, um, am, I, am I cool to go down? Does everyone have everything written from this they want to write? Do you need a minute? Okay. In the lysogenic cycle, you get something very similar, and I'm going to go with a simpler shaped bacterium or virus, rather. So here we have our virus. Okay, there she is. Okay, and here we have a cell. And that virus has DNA in it, right? What can happen is this can attach, and it can inject its DNA. And of course, I'm going to use a sort of human cell as an example and say, okay, here's our... Actually, I'm smart about this. I won't use red, and then we can show it. So this is the cell with all of its own DNA. And what can happen is this can latch on, and it can inject its DNA, um, and that DNA sometimes will just join in with the cell's DNA. Does that make sense? And then this cell can just kind of carry on its merry way. It can just kind of live its cell life, doing its cell stuff. I don't know, going to the cell mall and hanging out with its cell friends, and just, you know, doesn't know that anything's amiss. Um... So the viral DNA can lay dormant for a period of time. And that period of time can be very long or it can be very short. It, it just depends. But um, a classic example of this would be uh, the human immunodeficiency human immunodeficiency virus, obviously known as? Yeah? No, human immunodeficiency virus. What's that? Oh. HIV. Mm -hmm. HIV. Um, the human immunodeficiency virus is transmitted how, typically? I mean, it can be transmitted a few ways, but the main way we think of it. Yeah, blood-to-blood -blood contact is one, and the more common one we think of is? Sexually, it's sexually transmitted infection, right? It's an STI. And some STIs are bacterial-based infections and some are viral infections. Uh, HIV is a virus, hence the V. Um, so the HIV virus, when it first makes its way into somebody, um, can lay dormant. And so somebody can have HIV and not be aware that they have HIV. There can be, and, and it lays dormant for a period even before detection. So there is a there's often a lag between somebody contracting HIV and the point at which it has rep reproduced enough in their body that they can be identified as HIV positive, um, which is one of the things that made HIV spread um, quite quickly is that it can sort of evade detection for a period. Um, and then HIV in particular can sort of then, for a long period, do sort of low-level reproduction, where it will reproduce but not sort of spread at much of a fast rate. And then, after some period of time of somebody being HIV positive, um, this can begin to actively and very rapidly reproduce. And the HIV virus, in particular, um, attacks, well, immunodeficiency. What does it attack? Yeah. So it actually attacks the immune cells of the body, which is horrible, right? Because the, immu the job of the immune system is to fight off things like viruses, HIV. And so the HIV virus, once it begins to really spread and reproduce, it is spreading and reproducing by doing so in the white blood cells, the T cells of the host, which means that um, as the body is trying to ramp up its immune response, because it now knows it's infected with a virus, the virus is attacking those cells and destroying them and making more virus. And that's why this was deadly. Um, in the 80s, uh, in the late 70s, 80s through the early 90s, 
HIV was a death sentence. Um, for a while, one could be HIV positive and asymptomatic, but eventually what happens in this cycle is that there is a trigger, and when that trigger happens, um, then the cell begins to produce new viruses, and these will cause lysis and spread. In other words, it now enters what we would call the lytic phase. Um, and that will cause lysis. So eventually this enters the lytic, lytic phase, enters the lytic cycle, and now it actively um, infects the host. Um, this is obviously, we tend to think of this more in multicellular organisms like us, right? And so the next stage would be that this breaks open and now each of these is free to repeat the process, right? Sorry, these cells, or these viruses look terrible. Just, you know what, Kaylin Clark, I didn't ask you for your critique of my artwork, all right? I'm sorry, I'm doing my best. I lash out because I'm sensitive. Sorry? I was trying out my Dutch. Yeah, a lot of double A's in Dutch. I played that out earlier, and no one heard me, so I just kind of ignored it. Yeah, it seems like a mature response, but that's fine. I don't like the no, please, joking aside, please always, um, right? And each of these is now able to infect another cell. Please always point out my errors. Um, okay, so to show it, what happens in the lysogenic cycle is you get infection, you get the DNA incorporating, but you don't immediately get. You don't immediately get the reproduction of the virus. Instead, this cell just kind of lays, does its thing and it lays dormant. And then at some point it will enter the lytic cycle and begin infection. So there's just a delay between infection and spread in lysogenic viruses. And then of course each of those viruses can now go and spread. Um, and uh, HIV is an example of we have not been able to effectively uh, create a vaccine for HIV so far. But what we have made are what we call antiretroviral drugs, which basically um, somebody who is HIV positive, we can keep them in this sort of lysogenic state. We can keep them where they're HIV positive but don't acti actively have uh, the disease it causes, which of course is called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, oh, AIDS, okay. right? So HIV is the, the virus that causes AIDS. Yeah? This is like really random and off topic and you don't have an answer right now, but yeah. what do the cells look like when it's an autoimmune disease? Um, I don't know, but I'll look it up. I, uh, I, I don't know. I don't have a good quick answer to that, so I'm going to hold off. Like Parkinson's or something. Yeah, so these are some very common uh, viruses you'll see here. Influenza, hepatitis C, rotavirus, bacteriophage, papillomavirus. Isn't it a happy-looking one? Uh, the Ebola virus, uh, the adenovirus. This is what causes common cold. Common cold is caused by the family we call adenoviruses. What's Ebola? That's a flesh-eating disease. It's, it's no good. Uh, bacteriophage infects bacteria. Influenza, that causes the flu. Hepatitis C, what does that infect? Your liver, that's right. Uh, rotavirus, another respiratory virus. Papillomavirus, what's that infect? Sorry? Yeah, for P, he's a butterfly. Oh, sure. That's a very good French joke. Ha. Um, oh, French, right? Oh, anyway, um, <laughs> is that inappropriate? No. Je suis désolé, Madame Trapp. Uh, so you know, the papillomavirus, um, the human papillomavirus, primarily is another sexually transmitted infection, um, and it largely um, infects the urogenital system. Um, so it, it's sexually transmitted and it's carried in, in the gen in genitalia, but mostly for males, uh, this ends up being an asymptomatic thing. So men tend to be carriers of HPV who never develop symptoms. There's some evidence that's associated with higher risks of penile cancer and prostate cancer, but kind of at the lower level. Um, but it is highly, highly, highly correlated um, with uterine cancers. So 
the evidence is shaky on whether men have any elevated risk of anything at all if they have HP HPV, but women uh, end up with something like 80%, 85% elevated risk of developing uterine cancers if they carry HPV, which is why we vaccinate young women for it now. We should also vaccinate young men. Different discussion. Maybe they do now. Do they finally? Yeah. For a long time, we were very sexistly just in just vaccinating young women. It seemed very stupid to me. Um, but yeah, so at, at a certain time, it was estimated, like a generation before me, that about 75% of adult, adults were carrying HPV. Gross. Um, and we brought that down with your generation to close to 0%. Vaccinations work. Um, and they, are, again, are associated with decreased risk. And again, with something that's completely asymptomatic for men, you can see how spread would be rampant. Because for something that produces no visible signs, no visible symptoms, um, it's easy to pass on a virus that you don't know you have and never know you have, right? Um, yeah. So viruses come in many different shapes and sizes, as seen above, but no matter the shape or size, they have the same basic structure. Just like we said, they have the capsule, and the capsule is made of protein, um, and they have the genetic material and that is made of DNA or RNA. And I'm going to hold off on talking about prions. I'm not going to go to the last possible second on you guys. Um, it's not a big deal. Tomorrow, in my absence, you guys will have a little project to work on. You're going to be making a, uh, a dichotomous key so if you want to get thinking, um, I don't have the paper for you yet, but you're going to be picking 10 different organisms, and I'd like them to be related. In other words, I don't want you to do one of the ones we did that was kind of a goofy one, where it was like, oh, here's a, here's a truck, here's a race car, here's a butterfly. Um, but rather, if you're really into whales, you could do a dichotomous key to identify the different types of whales. Or if you're into sharks, you could make a dichotomous key to identify 10 different species of sharks. Does that make sense? Um, and I will... Uh, put that up on Teams, and I will have a paper handout for you guys tomorrow. <clears throat> when you go to do it, I just want to say this now in case uh, we have trouble reading it. I don't care if you make like a physical one on paper <coughs> or if you make something digital. It can be handwritten, it can be typed, it can be digital. Um, I will share a couple of exa examples with you, but one I really liked... Um, uh, a couple of years ago... Let's see if I can find it. Um, uh, what is that? Copy link. Um, one I really liked a couple of years ago, they actually uh, like did it in PowerPoint or in slides, I'm not sure which, and they like uh, had it be like interactive, like click here. That was pretty cool. I was impressed by that. Yeah, they used PowerPoint. So this is like uh, different types of insects, and they said, does it fly? And so you could be like, oh, I have this insect in front of me. Yes, it does fly. Does it have one or two sets of wings? So this has two sets of wings. Does it have more than two colors? No, it doesn't. Is it primarily yellow-green, or is it more brownie-red? Oh, this one's brownie-red. And then, oh, look, you have a snake fly, a Gula adnixa. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, but you are also welcome to do it by hand. I will give you the assignment itself in a rubric tomorrow, and I will probably tentatively make it do Monday. But... I, I'm I'm flexible. Um, if you guys are like, no, we need more time than that. Sorry, I'm here Friday. Um, yeah, so that's all.